to start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come and fellowship once again, Lord. We can come freely and, Lord, just hear from your word and what you have to speak to us. I pray that our hearts will be open to hear your message today in Jesus' name. So this morning I want to continue on in the book of John and we're going to be in the John chapter 3 this morning. So it's been a while since I last spoke, so I'm just going to do a bit of a review on the book of John, just what we've covered so far. And just starting off with what John's purpose is in writing the whole book. And just to be reminded, because it's good to keep it in in mind as we go through. And he says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. I say that because there's many lessons obviously we can take from it. But John's got in his primary focus all throughout it. He wants you to get this idea, Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah, the Son of God. And all that he writes builds up to that and builds an argument as we go along. And in the first couple of chapters, we've got the opening claim that the writer makes about the deity of Christ, the word becoming flesh. And then you've got, in the rest of chapter 1 there, you've got John the Baptist testifying that Jesus is the Son of God. Followed by the first disciples coming to Jesus when he says, come follow me, spend time to me and find out for yourself who I am. In chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, we've got Jesus starts performing signs in Canaan, miracles by turning the water into wine. And then Jesus also reveals himself to his disciples when he goes into the temple and cleans out all the money changers, all those who have turned what should have been a place of worship into a place of business. And he shows his love, his zeal for the Lord, by clearing it out and trying to return it to a place where people come and worship the Lord. And he ended the chapter 2 with this in verses 24, so, sorry, 23. Now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name and did the signs which he did, sorry, and saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. And that's sort of the intro to what happens in chapter 3. And I'm just going to go through, and I'm going to read this account, which we're probably familiar with, of Nicodemus coming to Jesus. So we'll read it from start to finish, and then we'll come back and look in closer detail. So chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly I say to you, We speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, 
that whoever believes in him should not perish but should have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been, that they have been done in God. So that's the passage I want us to look at today. And as I said, it continues on from the end of chapter 2 with Jesus' statement that he wouldn't commit himself to man. And notice how it starts the chapter and it repeats it just to make sure you get the point. I'm not going to commit myself to man. So there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So the author of the book of John here is trying to reveal to you what's, why wouldn't he commit himself to man? Well, he gives the illustration of what man thinks and how man thinks through this man, Nicodemus. So who was Nicodemus? Verse 1, it tells us he was a Pharisee. But not only was he a Pharisee, he was a ruler of the Jews. So during that day, the Pharisees, they were very zealous about keeping the law and they did have a very, well, they really desired to keep it in all its entirety and miss nothing out. But amongst that, there were other groups too. And there was a ruling council called the Sanhedrin. And that was made up of about 70 people. And they basically acted as, even though they were under Roman rule, they acted as basically a Jewish council, a Jewish government, and had power and authority to rule over the people in most matters there. At one stage, they had the ability to pass laws even up to the point of condemning a man to death. By this stage that had been taken away so they could condemn a man to death but they couldn't actually bring it up to pass. They had to get approval from the Roman authorities. But basically they were a very powerful council. So what they said and ruled happened basically like the act of government. So Nicodemus was one of these leaders of the country. He wasn't just a Pharisee, not just a religious man. He was also one of the highest people in the Jewish society at that time. So this man, Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews, he came to Jesus by night and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Again, it refers back. Jesus has just been in Jerusalem for the Passover and he started doing signs and people are aware of it, they've seen it. Nicodemus too has seen and heard it. So he decides to come to him. And it's significant that he comes by night. Why would he come tonight? There's a few ways to take it. Obviously Jesus starting to do signs, he's starting to get a following. So it might have been just that it's easier to have a private conversation with Jesus without the crowds there and the only time he could do it is to come by night. But what's to stop him asking for a private invite? Jesus, come to my house in day and we have a private conversation. So Nicodemus came to him wanting it to be not made aware to the public that he wants to talk to Jesus. He's doing it in secret. And it's a theme that John runs through this gospel here that he says in verse 5 of chapter 1, and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. There's going to be some that want to work under the cover of darkness rather than doing things in the light where it can be seen. 
And it appears as though Nicodemus is one of these men who's trying to act under the cover so his deeds won't be known. What he's doing, he doesn't want other people to know. So he comes to Jesus by night and he addresses him as rabbi, teacher. So he realizes that what Jesus is doing is significant. He doesn't call him, so he's a ruling class. He addresses him not just as some lowly peasant one, but he does actually address him as a rabbi. And we see the reason he does it is because he's seen the signs that Jesus has done. Because no one can do these signs you do unless God is with him. And we might say, that's good. Nicodemus is respecting Jesus. But he falls short. Because here he is, a Pharisee, dresses him as teacher. He sees signs, but he doesn't acknowledge what the signs point to yet. He falls short of what the signs are actually pointing to. And he's only willing to acknowledge rabbi. So he makes this statement about Jesus being a teacher. And then Jesus responds to him and says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In one sense, it seems a little bit disconnected. He just says, you're a teacher. And then Jesus addresses him about the kingdom of God. And we have to keep in mind, again, the Jewish people are on the lookout for God's kingdom to come, for a Messiah to come where they could really rule, free from the Romans. They could have complete government. They're on the lookout for this saviour. And Jesus knows that. He knows what the leaders are about, the rulers are looking for. And he says to him, most assuredly, unless one is born again, he cannot see this kingdom of God. So you'll notice that some of the translations too, this one is the New King James, says that you'll be born again, but it's probably more correctly translated that it's born from above, born from heaven, is the actual translation. So Jesus starts to expose this man's thought. He knows that he's thinking about the Messiah and he wants something. He's the ruling class, so what happens when the Messiah comes? He's going to be ruling over a Jewish kingdom that comes. Or so he thinks. And Jesus says, you can't do it unless you're born from above, born from heaven. So that word, it can be translated either again or from above. So Nicodemus, he takes it as Jesus, meaning you've got to be born again. He takes it in the literal understanding when he says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Logical, makes sense. You can't go back again. You can only be born once. And Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, or truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So Jesus in his first response says, you're, you can't see the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again. And now it's slightly different and he says, unless you're born of water and the spirit, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. And he makes it clear that he's not talking about just being physically born again. And he separates the two. That which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So there's two births that happen in everyone's life, or could happen. You've got the physical birth that we're all aware of and what Nicodemus was referring to. But there is a spiritual birth where you become aware of spiritual things and how God is working. And God says until you become aware of the spiritual reality of things, you're not going to be able to enter this kingdom of God. You can't just live in the physical realm and expect to get to see this kingdom of God. And that, he knows that's going to shock Nicodemus. In verse 7, Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. 
I've spoken about this expectation of Messiah, and there's many prophecies, but I'll just draw attention to one of them, to why they're thinking this way of a physical kingdom. And if you've got your Bible, it's in Psalm 110, and just verses 5 and 6 point out this picture of what this Messiah is and what he's going to do. So in Psalm 110, verses 5 and 6, it says, The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations, and he shall fix the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. Does that sound like a spiritual kingdom there, a spiritual ruler? They're expecting a warrior to come who's going to execute these nations. They're under Roman control, even though they have some autonomy. He's wanting someone to come and free him from it. That's what the Messiah is going to do. He's going to execute the Gentile nations. Israel is going to rule. And remember, he's part of the Sanhedrin, the ruling class. He's expecting this new Israelite kingdom to take place. So what Jesus says is quite shocking with his revelation of a different birth and how you've got to enter into this kingdom. It doesn't say you're going to have to be a warrior and fight with me. You're going to have to be born again. And in verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And this verse is a bit of a mystery. We've all seen the wind and we've probably got quite a scientific explanation that we give for the wind and how it works. But we still don't completely understand everything about the wind. But the facts are, we see the effect of it. We hear the sound of it. We see what it does. We see where it goes. You definitely see it when a cyclone and other things come over and it knocks trees and houses and everything over. And he says, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And there's a few ways you can take this verse. And one of them, the way that it's interpreted is, and I don't know if you've heard it, among theological circles it's called the doctrine of regeneration. And what it basically entails is, and the wind is the illustration of it, is that everyone, when they're born, is depraved. Basically, they've got no way of becoming good and coming to God, unless God makes it happen. So what this regeneration is, it's about the spirit starting something in a man and making them alive to the spiritual things, to the things of God. And it can probably be illustrated in someone's life and maybe in your own personal life, about you might have heard God's word before. You might have heard you need to be saved. You might have heard all of this and it meant nothing to you. You know all about Christianity. You know all about the message of God and the call to be saved and it does nothing. And yet all of a sudden something changes that you just can't explain. For some reason in your life, something changes in you and you become aware of this. So whereas all of these messages before it meant nothing in one ear, out the other, all of a sudden, it's speaking to you. And that's the understanding of, you can, it hasn't come about of your own will becoming aware of spiritual things. It's an act of the spirit. You didn't make it happen because you wanted it to, but rather God made you aware of what's going on. And all of a sudden you're seeing, you're aware of all these things. Another way to take this, and we'll step back a second, to what does it mean being born of water and the Spirit? One of the main ways that it's understood is this. From Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27. And it's a prophecy here talking about Israel's regeneration. But it says, 
Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols, and I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. See the reference there to being made clean with water and being the God's spirit becoming part of you. And it's quite likely Jesus was referring to this. And that's emphasized in the next few verses when Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Again referring to be born again. When Jesus said to him, are you a teacher of Israel and don't know these things? It's something that he should have been aware of, should have known. He's a teacher of the law. He's not just a teacher. Notice it says he is the teacher of Israel. This is something he should have known and been teaching the people. And you don't know how it's going to happen. You don't know that you've got to come aware of God again. You think that the Messiah is just going to come and give you this kingdom, but you don't have to follow him. You don't have to do his commandments, have his spirit within you. He's just going to win all your battles for you and you're going to rule. Don't you know the scriptures? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen and you don't receive our witness. This is what they've been telling him. And it starts back in the chapter 1 of John. Jesus has been pointing. And you've got the testimony of John the Baptist. And his message at baptism was repent, turn from your ways and come back to God again. Come back to following God. And John's been testifying Jesus is the Messiah. Why are you seeing all these signs? Why are you dead to all these things that are happening around you? You can see the wind. You can see the signs. And yet you're blind to it all. You're not going to get to the kingdom of heaven, Nicodemus. Why do you keep rejecting our testimony? And it's interesting to note here too that this you, it's hard to tell in the English, but these you is actually in the plural. So when he's addressing this, he's not just addressing Nicodemus, he's addressing all of the Sanhedrin here, who Nicodemus represents. He's saying, all of this count, you counsel, you've seen these signs, you've heard the testimony of John to repent for the kingdom of God is coming. And you've heard him say, Jesus is the Messiah. But you reject the witness. And you call yourself a teacher of Israel. If you've been told earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? You've got this testimony going out, these signs you can see. They're happening here on earth. And yet you want me to tell you about how God's kingdom's going to come about? tell you these secret things, what God is thinking, and yet you reject when you hear your testimony now. You reject when I give you this testimony. You're not teaching the people. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So here's the teacher of Israel being taught by Jesus what truly is going to happen and what God's plan is, the heavenly plan, as he reveals just a glimpse of it to him. 
So no one's ascended to heaven but him who came down from heaven, that's the Son of Man. God himself is the only one who can come down from heaven and go back up into the presence of God. And his purpose, this Messiah, God's purpose is to act just like Moses, is to complete this same purpose of Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness. And the story is told back in the book of Numbers that you had all the Israelites grumbling and complaining and rebelling against God. So God sent a plague of snakes amongst them, vipers that would bite them, and people were dying. And he instructed Moses to build a serpent, a bronze serpent, and to raise it up. And anyone who looked at that serpent would not die. They would live. It wasn't a magic serpent, but it was that act of faith and obedience that would make them well. So even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, and it's pointing again to Jesus' death and what he's going to do, that death on the cross. He's going to be lifted up as a symbol for everyone to see. But you need to look up and not turn your head from it and think, I know better, there's no way that this symbol can save me. What's a bronze snake going to do for me? You're going to have to have faith. Jesus is coming to act at this time like the bronze servant. And he states his purpose, which is contrary to what they're expecting with the Messiah. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. Notice the role of the judge, the Messiah, when he comes to judge the nations and also the Sanhedrin who were in position of power to judge. I'm not coming to judge this time. I'm coming to save. I want to see people living, not dead. He flips Nicodemus's whole world view right around. From one of sitting in a position of power and judging other people to one who should be compare, sorry, compassionate towards his fellow man. One who wants to see them live and thrive, not die and be punished. And it's a foretaste of what Jesus is going to show when he goes to the Samaritan woman in the next chapter. This isn't just extending to Israel too. This is going to extend to all nations. You're to care for them. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. It's a precious promise that most of us have probably been taught from when we've our first experience. And we hold on to the verse, and rightly so, that Jesus gave his son that, so that we can have life so that we wouldn't perish. But something we probably miss is that when he gave it to Nicodemus, it was also a rebuke to his thinking, his way of thinking there. You've got it wrong. And I sometimes, and I wonder about us in the church or maybe those who have been Christians for a while, Sometimes whether we get hardened off and we just, we see all the wickedness around or we want our own way and we just want God to judge and deal with everyone else. And we stop loving people. We just want to see them condemned. And we start to lose the same purpose Jesus had. If you're a disciple, you follow what your master does. Jesus came to save, not to condemn. And we just want to live with the, we're saved now, so we want everyone else condemned. So there's also a gentle rebuke in there for Nicodemus that I think is there for us today. And it's easy to slip into. We want our way and our best, but we don't care about others anymore. We want to rule with Christ in heaven. Do we want other people to be there with us? Do we care for our fellow man? He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 
And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. And this particularly speaks to Nicodemus and the Sanhedrin. As I said, they sat as rulers over the country, condemning people, and we'll soon see how much they wanted to condemn Jesus. And Jesus says to them, if you reject me, you're condemned already. You're not going to see this kingdom of God. And that's your condemnation that God has sent his son and you haven't believed. You haven't trusted. God sent a symbol of life, like this snake, this serpent that you need to look up to. You judge yourself if you don't look up. It's already happened. Because you won't believe what God has already told you. You want him to save you, but you won't do what he says. You're condemned already. You're more content to live in darkness. You're more content to do your own will, to live your own life rather than God's. He's come to show you what life is all about, to shine a light. Yet when we want to do our own will, we're in darkness. And you are condemned for it. You condemn yourself. And men love it. They love to be in control. All of us do. And there's many that will perish because they want that. Because they love this darkness. Rather than letting God expose them for who they are, expose what life is all about. They'd rather live in darkness and have it their own way. And you'll be condemned. So John always brings about these contrasts. There's this way of light, and there's going to be those who respond to it. And there's a way of darkness. There's going to be those who see it and turn away. He has said Jesus is the light. And the question that he posed there is, will you believe it? And it's the question that stands today. We have his word. We have his testimony. It's freely available to know who he is. It's not enough to say, I'm ignorant. It's there and available. The light is there for you. What are you going to do with Jesus? Are you going to make a Messiah that suits your purposes, that just does what you're bidding, deals with all your problems? Or are you going to go and respond to allowing God's Spirit to work in your life, to change that repentance, that turning away from your wicked ways? and follow Jesus and be his disciple. It would have been a challenge to the people that John was writing to because they were being condemned by the same Jewish people at this time too when they became Christians. And they would have been facing these questions, very serious questions. Is it worth following Jesus? People would have been saying, he's not the Messiah. Look. He's not judging all the nations. He can't be our Messiah. John is arguing, look at this testimony. He meets the scripture. He's come to save. And he will address further on in his testimony, Jesus is also judge when he comes again a second time. And he has that authority, but even though he has it, he's not seeking to condemn, but only to save those who will come to him and follow him. So there's assurance in this passage, if you haven't come to Jesus, you don't have to be condemned. doesn't matter how bad it is, you can come to him and your sins can be forgiven. He came so that you might have eternal life. But there's also a challenge for just those who are in church we might get hardened off to those around us. But we need to keep on loving those around and following his example. We need to be out there telling people that he is the light. It's not enough to hide it under a bushel. We need to be out there caring 
and seeking to save those who are lost. We can't do it, but we can bring that message to them. He is the one who saves. We can tell them, look, there is a way to life. And I'd challenge us to try to find ways in our life that we can do it. Whether we're married into a family or have family or kids who don't believe in God, we need to bring that testimony. Whether it's at work, whether it's just in community groups we're in, wherever it is, we need to be shining that light and telling people to come to Jesus. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. And it's only in him that you can have life. Let's not wait for the world just to be condemned. We're to be about his business. We need to be telling others about him. And I'll just close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your truth of your word and how you reveal what you've come to do. And how your desire, Lord, is for people to be saved and not condemned. Lord, that we can have that assurance, that we can have that life. Lord, if we are seeking our own will, I just pray that you'll give us the ability to turn from it and to turn to you. And Lord, that here in Darwin, in this church, and wherever we may be, Lord, that we will tell others about you, that you are the true light, the Messiah, so that others too may be saved and not condemned. Empower us to do it, Lord, through your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Just ask.